I had only been living in Illinois for two years and in the town of New Salem for not even six months when I decided to run for political office for the first time and not some little local office. I put my name in to be a representative of the people in the state legislature, the Illinois General Assembly. In early March, five months before the election, I had a handbill printed in the Sangamo Journal announcing my campaign and what I would strive to do if elected. Despite my own family's Jacksonian Democrat heritage, I by this time aligned myself with the opposition of what would soon become known as the Whig Party, whose national leader was Senator Henry Clay of Kentucky. The manner in which elections were conducted back then might surprise you, especially if you are used to a so-called secret ballot. There was nothing secret about voting back then. The state law governing elections in Illinois read as follows. The manner of voting shall be by the electors approaching the bar in the election room at any time when the poll was open and addressing the judges of the election in his proper person and with an audible voice to be heard by the judges and clerks of the election to mention by name the persons he intends to vote for to fill the different offices which are to be filled at the said election and the clerk shall enter his name and vote accordingly, and he shall then withdraw. Now, do you think that could possibly affect how you choose to vote? You might say that I was engaged in another election during the years 1840 to 1842, but this was not a political election. I mentioned earlier a certain Miss Mary Todd, who by this time was living in Springfield with her sister Elizabeth. The suitors for Mary were in abundance, and among them was one particularly promising young man, a rising lawyer and politician with a bright future. His name, Stephen A. Douglas. As for me, I was at a decided disadvantage in relation to Douglas in nearly every respect, family connections, education, wealth, social graces, even physical appearance. Politically, he was clearly my superior you might say that this was the first Lincoln-Douglas election, and you know who finally won this one. The election of the U.S. Senator from Illinois by the General Assembly would also prove contentious. After months of posturing and positioning, the vote took place in early February 1855. There were three leading candidates. The Democratic incumbent James Shields was a Nebraska man, while I, still representing the Whig Party, and Congressman Lyman Trumbull, a Democrat, were decidedly anti-Nebraska. On the first ballot, I got 44 votes and Trumbull five, for a total of 49, just one short of the 50 needed by a single candidate to win, since only 99 members were present that day. As the next few ballots were taken, at least two other men indicated a willingness to support me, which could have given me the election if those five Trumbull men would join us. But these five were all staunch Democrats who absolutely refused to vote for a Whig. Since Trumbull's supporters, led by Norman Judd, wouldn't budge, those who preferred me began to gradually switch their votes over to Trumbull, even as on the Nebraska side the votes were being switched from Shields to Governor Madison. In the ninth round of balloting, Madison reached 47 votes, just three short of victory. I instructed my followers to vote in block for Trumbull. When they protested the injustice of the candidate who held 90% of the anti-Nebraska vote in the early ballots, gifting the election to the one who held only 10%, I said, you will lose both Trumbull and myself, and I think the cause in this case is to be preferred to men. My men seated, and Trumbull was elected senator with the necessary 50 votes on the 10th ballot. I was severely disappointed, of course but took satisfaction in the fact that Illinois had elected a committed anti-Nebraska senator to counterbalance Douglas, author of the hated Kansas-Nebraska Act. The convention was originally going to be held somewhere in Ohio, as I recall, but toward the end of 1859, my friends David Davis and Jesse Fell of Bloomington had gotten the idea that if the convention could be moved to Chicago, it would help my chances. Not that my chances were very good, you understand. Everyone expected that William Seward of New York would be our nominee, and if for some reason it wasn't him, well, there were Sam and Chase of Ohio, Edward Bates of Missouri, or any number of other better qualified candidates than me. But Davis and Fell insisted that I suggest this idea to the Republican state chairman, who happened to be Norman Judd, the one who ruined my own chances to be elected senator back in 1855. Judd agreed 
and went to see the Republican National Committee in New York, where he made the case that Ohio wasn't an appropriate location as it was Chase's home state. He suggested Chicago instead, a neutral location. And the committee agreed, which tells you that no one was thinking about me as a serious contender. I did not attend the convention, of course. None of the candidates did that. Instead, I awaited news back here in Springfield, where I received regular reports by telegraph. Now, I'm not sure how much of the following story is true, but I've been told that the managers of my campaign felt that something underhanded must have taken place for so many of Seward's supporters to have gotten the tickets for the main seating area. And they thought, well, two can play this game. And they had 300 duplicate tickets printed up for the day of the balloting and distributed these to some Illinois boys telling them to show up early and go in there and make some noise for old Abe. The New Yorkers, meanwhile, took their time arriving, parading through the streets behind a brass band, and by the time they got to the wigwam, they discovered their seats taken by the Illinois boys. They were still allowed in, and it didn't change who could vote, but the Seward contingent was now no longer the dominant voice in the convention. I know this sort of thing doesn't normally happen in Chicago, but... By the way, were you keeping track? I hear that some people today talk of my numerous failures to be elected until I was suddenly elected president. But I've just told you about the nine times I was in a direct election of the people. Five times for the Illinois General Assembly, one time for Congress, another time for the General Assembly, and then twice for president. I lost the very first of these nine elections when I was but 23 years old, but I won the next eight. And I tried twice to be senator, which were not direct votes of the people, and you might say that I really should have been chosen both times. And then there are those two non-political elections, one for captain during the Black Hawk War, and the other for the hand of Miss Mary Todd, and I won both of those. Do I still sound like a miserable failure in terms of elections?